want to give a hello to everybody who's at home. Uh, we're doing the best with some of the technology today. First time back in Sheridan, but we're super committed to continuing to have a service online for people who can't make it, people who are making sure to stay safe. And, uh, and for some of our friends who are connecting with us online from other parts of the state and other parts of the country, we're so glad that you're with us. Um, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is Stephanie. I'm the lead pastor here at Mill City, and we are so grateful to have you here with us at Sheridan School um, and to have you join us in our community. We're just excited to have anybody with us today. And if you're a newer person, I'd love a chance to meet you if I haven't yet. Um, I thought I'd start off today with story time with Pastor Steph. Does that sound okay? Story time with Pastor Steph? People are like, what kind of stories does she tell? All right. Here's how it starts. Once upon a time, okay, 13 years ago, like this week, I sat out on this patio, and it was hot. It was August 13 years ago this week. And I sat out on this patio, and I'm, I'm, I'm sitting with this guy who I had had a class with at Bethel Seminary. He looked kind of like Clark Kent. Yeah, he told me his name was Michael Bender, but I'm, like, trying not to accidentally call him Clark the whole time. And we sit down. I, he asked me if we could connect. And so we're sitting on this patio. We're having coffee. And then he just launches into this story, and I don't even know exactly why we're there. And this is how it begins. He says God had been speaking to him and his wife, Carissa, and a few other people, and, and they were talking about how God was urging them to start a new church, and they felt like God was saying it was supposed to be in northeast Minneapolis. And I'm going, like, how do you know that? And they're like, well, people had dreams. People were prayer walking. People had visions, and they felt like northeast Minneapolis was the place. Now, if you know me, you know I had a lot of questions. So some questions were things like, well, does this church have a name? Does this church have a place to worship? And he said, well, no, 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 it doesn't have a name yet, and it doesn't have a place to worship. We're, we're thinking maybe we, we'll get together, but we do have a mission. And our mission, we think, is going to be to love our community in the name of Jesus. So no name, no place to worship, but we've got a mission. And so we're going to just go into the neighborhood and see if we can live that mission out. And I'm thinking, this is, this is really interesting. This little group of, of 15 or 20 people that Michael was talking about, they were having dreams and visions, but guess what? They weren't the only ones. Because I was, okay, I don't know if this has happened to you, but I was waking up in the middle of the night. And I didn't want to be waking up at 2 a.m., but I'm like, God, are you waking me up in the middle of the night? What's has this happened to anybody else where you think it might be God waking you up? A few people. And so I just start listening. And the things that were flowing through my head were things that, I'll be honest, I hadn't thought about that much. I had been in seminary or, or ministry school for quite some time, but I hadn't spent that much time praying and listening to God about the local church. But God's waking me up at 2 o'clock in the morning and giving me all these thoughts and these visions about what it could look like for a group of people together to come into a community and say, we want to love this community in the name of Jesus. And so I did what anyone I think would do, and I just started writing that stuff down so I could go back to sleep. That seemed like a good plan. So I'd write this stuff down and go back to sleep. And so, you know, I'm usually a pretty good sleeper. So I just wanted to get back to my eight hours because I'm a solid eight-hour person. And so all these thoughts were coming into my mind. And as Michael is sharing about what him and these other people have been talking about, I was starting to, like, freak out on the inside because he's using exact phrases and words that I felt like God was talking to me about in the middle of the night. And I'm thinking, how cool is that? God put me out here to have coffee with this guy to talk about these cool things that God's talking to both of us about. That is so cool. And so I'm sure I'm looking like excited about it. And then he said to me, you know, there's no name for this church, but we think that the church is supposed to be led by a team of leaders. And, and that group of people is going to come together and going to figure out what do we name this church? And then something surprised me. He said, actually, the reason I asked you to coffee today was to see if you would pray about being a part of this team of leaders to help start this new church. And I, I'm, I'm going to admit, I was shocked until that moment. I didn't know that's what the coffee was about. And so I hear myself say, oh, I think I've already been praying about that. <laughs> because of all the times that I was having like midnight journal sessions with Jesus or whatever was happening, I think that I've already been praying about that. And so I said to him, you know, let me think about it. And the next morning I got up and I wrote him an email and said, I'm in. Yes. Now, before I knew it, Michael had a group of people, I had a group of people, and we started coming here to meet at people's homes here in Northeast. Some people moved into Northeast and started to meet in homes by the end of August, so just a few weeks later, 13 years ago this month. 
we would be out serving in the community and, and helping out in some way, showing up to pick up trash or something. And people would be like, who are you? And we're like, we're from this church. Uh, and, and they said, oh, cool, where does your church, where is your church? And I'm realizing they're asking where our church has a worship service. But we don't have a worship service yet. So we would just look at each other like, well, most of us are here right now. So where is our church? Like, here we are. <laughs> like, this is us. And so that was the beginning of all of this. And we named Mill City after this nickname for Minneapolis, that some of you realize that. And I think the heart behind that was just, we're here to love this city. And when you have a little kid and you name them after somebody that you love, it's because you honor them and you love them, right? So we're like, we're just going to name this church after the city. And we call the church Mill City, named after the original vocations of Minneapolis. And that's what we named our little baby church, after the city. So if you're a part of this community now, then that's the beginning of our story. A story of a thousand yeses. A story of a thousand yeses. That yes in that email to Michael changed my whole life. Have you had experiences like that where you realize either then or later that that yes that you gave changed your whole life? I know I have had other ones as well. And so the thousand yeses that have come from all of you and from so many people, there has been an incredible story that God has told. But here's the thing. 13 years in, I'm confident it's just the beginning of what God's trying to do through this community. And over this whole year, we've been looking at this big story of God. We started in the beginning of the story, and we looked in Genesis, and then we've gone through the historical narrative, the law genre. We've been looking genre by genre through the wisdom and the poetry genre, and then just recently in the poetic book genre. And the goal of that is for us to say that this story is a story of God, and, and all of these stories point to Jesus. The, the, the climax of the story, the, the, the crescendo of the story. And so today, my friends, is a big day because we have made it to the Gospels. Yes, we have made it to the New Testament, my friends. Here we are, the New Testament. We made it to the Gospels. And as we go into the New Testament genres, I want you to pay attention to something important, and that is how important the Old Testament genres are for what we see happen in the New Testament. And so the Gospels, as we head into that narrative, you're going to see here in our text for today, the first three words are showing how important the Old Testament genres are to understand what God is doing through the story of Jesus. So if you have a Bible or an app, pull up John 1. And as we jump into the Gospels, let me just give you the, the, the synopsis. The Gospels are the four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that tell the stories of Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, and then his sending his earliest followers into the world to love the world that he cared about so much. So we're calling this conversation, This Is Our Story, The Way of Jesus in the Gospels. This is our story. In my opinion, this story, the story of Jesus, is the most compelling story ever told. And I hope that you'll see here today that the invitation to join into that story is an incredible invitation in our lives. The story of Jesus is good news. It's great news, which is literally what gospel means. It means good news. And this good news can be your story too. This good news can be our story. If we give Jesus our yes, if we say to Jesus, yes, I want your story to be my story. I want your story to be our story. And it changes everything. So the book of John is written by one of Jesus' disciples, one of the eyewitnesses who saw Jesus do what he did firsthand. And it opens with this poem. And so I want to read this poem to you from John 1, 1 through 14. And, and pay attention to the, even though it's in a poetic form, we're in a narrative book, but it starts with a poem. Pay attention to the genre there. This is how it starts in the NIV version. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning the, that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. 
Continuing in verse 9, the true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and through the world was made through, and the world was made through him. The world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not recognize him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. And I, I, can, I never can cease to do this. I want you to just look at that last verse in the message translation by Eugene Peterson. This is how Eugene Peterson puts it. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one-of-a-kind glory, like father, like son, generous from the inside out, true from start to finish. What an incredible description of, of God the Father and the Son. And so in the beginning there, this idea of in the beginning, there it is, right? The Old Testament genre. The beginning of John, the first three words in Genesis, in the beginning. This pointing back, but it doesn't end there. As, uh, as we see this idea of the, one, the word was there with God, there's a lot we can say about that really deep theological concept. But think about it this way. If you have thoughts in your mind and you speak them out, it's like it becomes something. God created everything, it says in Genesis, through his words. And so this poem is to be taken as kind of a metaphor that, that it's not that God created Jesus, but that the thoughts of God is a manifestation of God and the words of God is a part of God's mind. And so it's trying to talk about how close God the Father was to God the Son and that Jesus was there. Nothing was created without him. So important for our understanding of who Jesus was and is and is to come. That Jesus was there from the beginning. God created everything. And he was the embodiment of the mind of God. Jesus was there. Now John also does another kind of throwback to the Old Testament. And he does it by going through his, if you read through the book of John, he, he packs a bunch of stuff in there. And almost every time it's in sevens. So he has seven this, seven of that, seven of this, this number of completion that we first see in Genesis, in the creation story, this symbolic number of completion, number seven. And so there's a, a, a part right after what I just read where it kind of describes John the Baptist, not the same as John the author here, but John the Baptist and how he came to make a way for Jesus. And if you read through the rest of the first chapter, you'll see kind of this story play out. And, and in that story, John gives seven titles for Jesus. And uh, I pulled the, a screenshot from the Bible Project video where you can see the seven, seven titles for Jesus. The Lamb of God, the Son of God, Rabbi, the Son of Man, Messiah, the King of Israel, and Jesus of Nazareth. That happens all in, in that first chapter, the second half of that first chapter, because John's like, I'm going to pack it in there. And I, I like that. I'm kind of like that guy. Let's see how many words we can pack in. It's awesome. And then the seven titles, and this is the Tim Mackey and the Bible Project summarize it this way. Perfect. The seven titles could be, the fully human Jesus from Nazareth is the messianic king and teacher of Israel and the son of God who will die for the sins of the world. John's like, I'm going to pack all those titles in there so you have no doubt who I think this guy is. Because throughout the book of John, people wonder, who is this guy? What is he about? And so there we have it again, a throwback to the Old Testament. John is making this abundantly clear to his first century primarily Jewish audience, that the story of God, the big story of God that we've been talking about all year is the story of Jesus. He was there from the beginning, and here we are in the crescendo of the story where Jesus, who was there, the word from the beginning, becomes flesh and moves into the neighborhood. This is the crescendo of the story. Let me skip over to verse 16 and read what John says in verse 16. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son, who is himself God and is in closest relationship with the Father, has made him known. So all that had happened, everything we've talked about, all the things that we've seen when you look back at the story, you look through Jesus and you see that everything happened out of God's grace. Time and time again, God shows up and says, hey, we're going to redeem what's broken. Hey, 
You guys dropped the ball again, but I'm going to give you another chance and another chance. All of that grace. And then here, grace in place of grace already given, God has given Jesus, the embodiment of God's self. Grace has now come through Jesus Christ. The theological word is the incarnation, the incarnation of God, which basically means God in the flesh. Making God known, John says. Making God known in a totally different way than any God has ever even claimed. No story about any gods has claimed that a God would become fully human in the way that Jesus did. The story of God, then, invites us to join in this story. And it's in like a really deep way, like the deepest way possible we see here in John. The story of God invites us to let that become our story through this image of family. Becoming family. You see it right there in the text. Have you experienced being in relationship with people who weren't like your technical, biological family, but, but your family? I hope some of you have experienced that, where it's not like biological, but you're still like, these people are my family. Of course, we have the beautiful opportunity of adoption in our community where it's like you legally become part of our family. But this idea that something else can make you family is what God's heart is all about, this deep reality in John 1.12. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. If you have your Bibles, just look at that. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Believe. Did you catch that word there? To those who believed. John uses the word believe, which in Greek is pistuyo, 98 times. And nearly every time he's using it, it's a verb. And in most cases, I, I want to suggest, humbly, that there's maybe a better way we could translate it for how we understand things in our current culture. And that is instead of the word believe, which I think we sometimes think of belief, believe as belief set, which is a, a noun, like I have uh, you know, thoughts, beliefs, statements, concepts. We either intellectually agree with those or we don't. We either believe those things or we don't. And there's nothing wrong with that. But pistuyo probably would be better translated as a verb to mean trust trust. Here in this passage, we can read verse 12 like this. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who trust in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Those who trust, those who say, yes, I trust you. Those who might have to get up the next day and say yes again, because we live in a world where it's really tough. And sometimes we have to realize, okay, I got to say yes again to say, I want to be a part of the story, I want to take your story on, to say yes to the salvation that Jesus offers and know that that's a one-time thing, but then to say yes to following that story every day from then on. Saying yes to becoming a part of the family of God and taking up the way of Jesus is pretty distinct compared to the world around us. Perhaps you've noticed that. When I was a little kid, uh, my dad would often tell us stories, and they were Well, he said they were true stories, okay? And he said that they were stories about his life. And so we called them daddy stories. And so we would come up on his lap and we'd be like, tell us a daddy story, tell us a daddy story. And, you know, my dad, he's not alive anymore. He died when I was a teenager. But he had a kind of a crazy life in his relatively short life. So he would tell us these daddy stories that apparently were true about how he pulled a woman out of a burning building and, and took somebody out of a, of a car crash before the car blew up. And how he, one time, he lived in New Orleans, Louisiana, and he was in the bayou and he got bit by a water moccasin. Now, in Minnesota, we maybe don't understand. I understand that's poisonous. And then, like, walked home, like, sucking the venom out of his arm. These are the daddy stories I heard as a little kid. Am I making more sense? Yeah, okay. So then he would tell us these stories and he would talk about getting lost and how his parents found him, even though there was so many siblings. I mean, the stories would go on and on. I loved hearing the daddy stories. But now, when I look back on these stories, and he's not with us anymore, of course, so I can't fact check him. You know, that's not fair. But I see that he had great purpose in telling us these stories. There was a deep purpose because, of course, there was a moral to each story, right? We say there's a moral of the story. And it usually communicated something that he wanted us to understand about life, about the values that he had and the values of our family. Values that, of course, like any parent would hope, if you care about those values, you hope that your kids would care about those values and and take them on as your own identity. And in our earthly family, sometimes we're like, no, thank you, not that value, but this one seems good, you know. But that's what my dad was telling the stories for. 
so we could take on those values and take on that identity. It's like when he was telling us these stories, he was giving us these values like, like putting other people's lives ahead of yourself, even if it's dangerous. Or being people who are wise when you face a crisis and figuring out how to trust God in the midst of that. It's like through every story, he was saying, this is what it means to be a Williams. This is what it means to be in our family. And just like my dad's daddy stories, the Gospels tell this story of Jesus, continuing the story of Father God. And when we say yes to being in this family, because we have the right to become children of God, not if we understand it all, but if we trust in Jesus' name, then, then we have the right to become family. And the stories communicate more than just a value. They, they communicate our identity, who we are, whose we are, and what that means for our everyday lives. The difficult thing about this is that there's a lot of stories floating around us trying to tell us who we are, aren't there? And, and some of them are great stories. But to truly engage what it means to make Jesus' story our story, we have to sit with the, the tension that the world around us is full of stories, and those stories are shaping our identities as well. And oftentimes those stories are, are shaping our identities, and we don't even realize it. It's happening subconsciously, and that's actually something that we see in psychology. I thought it would be appropriate the day that we're sending off Christine Wu, Dr. Christine, I'm so sorry, Dr. Christine Wu, Dr. Wu. As we're sending Christine off, I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I shared with you something I learned by attending her dissertation defense? All right, now she's real smart, so put your thinking caps on. I'm about to tell you something I learned in the PhD defense from Dr. Christine Wu. So these researchers, uh, McLean, Mc, McLean and Syed, is that what you say? Okay. And, and Syed was your professor. No, oh, connected to the U of M, to the University of Minnesota. All right. I should have, I should have fact checked with you, this with you. I apologize. I hope you like your t-shirt. All right. So this paper, she sent me this paper. Because I said, that was so interesting what I heard in your dissertation. Could you send it to me? And it's 25 pages. So just sit down. We're going to talk through them. No, just kidding. I'm going to give you a very, very brief summary that probably won't do it justice. But we'll start with a picture. So look at this picture up here on the screen. And it describes these three narratives. And, and what, these, what these researchers are all about is looking at this model of identity that looks at how the narratives around us shape who we are and the understanding of our identities. And so when you look at this diagram, you see there's the master narrative, there's an alternative narrative and a personal narrative, and there's arrows going between them because they affect each other. And we engage with that, and, and they affect who we are and how we understand our personal narratives. So there's three types. Master narratives, according to these, these researchers, are culturally shared stories that tell us about a given culture and provide guidance about how to be a good member of that culture. And so if you ever are entering into another culture, you're looking for that. What, what, who are we here? How do I engage with this culture? But think about what those uh, are in dominant North American culture. What are our master narratives that shape our lives? They're not necessarily good or bad, but they influence our personal narratives, don't they? They, they influence the personal narratives of the people whose lives are being lived within these big stories that are being told in our culture. And so this is what they say in the paper. Okay, ready? Here, put your brains on. As individuals construct a personal narrative, they negotiate and internalize the master narratives. For many people, these master narratives are functional and unproblematic. Others, however, may need to construct or adopt an alternative narrative, which at minimum differs from the master narrative, at maximum like resists the master narrative, but it's different. So the researchers briefly discuss some of these narratives that we see in the United States. Once again, not necessarily bad or good, but they are what they are. You might be able to recognize these. First of all, like the narrative of the American dream. The idea that upward mobility is based on effort or merit, and if you, if you put a lot of effort in, then you should be able to move up and move forward. Another master narrative for us in our dominant cultures is individualism. This idea that we, we might connect with each other, but for the most part, like, I got to be able to do things on my own or just my family. And, and it, it, it sees us as individual and independent from other people. So for some people, that narrative serves them really well. But for the people that that narrative doesn't serve very well, they develop these alternative narratives to say, hey, well, that didn't work for me. So for example, if you're someone who's marginalized and for some reason in your family, 
uh, because of whatever reason you might be marginalized, your effort has not led to upward mobility. And so that master narrative doesn't seem true. And so you develop an alternative narrative to form your understanding of yourself. Well, if that master narrative says I just have to work harder, why is that not happening for my family? Another example would be how many people of color would say that they feel like they're living in a completely different country, a completely different America than some of the white people that they're around as, the, as white people talk about their narratives and their stories. So here's what's so tricky. The researchers found that under most circumstances, individuals are completely unaware of how these master narratives and alternative narratives are affecting them in their life. They're defining themselves by stories they don't even know that they're living into. They're, they're internalizing them unconsciously. The process of internalization happens without even realiz realizing it. And even when we try to realize it and say, okay, wait a second, I don't know if the American dream story, I don't know if that individualism is what I see I want to be as a person who is in the family of God. It's really hard when you're kind of like swimming in the world of those other narratives to kind of choose an alternative narrative or a different narrative. But here's what, why this makes so much sense to me. When we say yes to the way of Jesus, we start the lifelong process of negotiating a different story. The story of Jesus, the way of Jesus, is not a master narrative in our dominant culture. It's an alternative narrative. Christine and I were talking about this. We live in a world where some of the master narratives have taken on the name of Jesus, haven't they? They've taken it out. They just said, well, we'll just slap Christian on that. And that's the master narrative. And so that's about Jesus. And so that's where we get phrases like Christian nation. That's where we get actions of violence and greed being done in the name of Jesus or Christianity. These have been powerful master narratives in our world, haven't they? They shape us, sometimes without even knowing it, sometimes when we don't want them to shape us. And Christine and I were agreeing on this, that the way of Jesus is not a master narrative. It's not how the dominant stories tell us what the good life is. The way of Jesus is an alternative narrative to the dominant narratives around us. So as followers of Jesus, we must do something important. And I learned this from Raymond, who's here. We must interrogate our thoughts, interrogate our stories. Are these stories that are shaping us actually the heart of God and the heart of Jesus that we see in God's story? What narratives are shaping us? And then, and this is my challenge to myself and all of us, we must pursue the way of Jesus with all of our hearts and minds and souls. Anything less than that full pursuit of the alternative narrative of the way of Jesus will mean being swept up in the dominant narratives that are swimming around us all day long. And they will shape us into who we become. So as John uses this first chapter of his gospel, I mean, he's doing something important. He's laying the groundwork for what the rest of this story of Jesus is about. He outlines pretty clearly this way of Jesus. He's making it pretty clear. What are we saying yes to? When we make Jesus' story our story, what are we saying yes to? So I see three ways. We'll put them up on the screen for you. Now, before Christianity was considered a religion, and before it had the term Christianity, have you heard what the people were called? They were called the people of the way. The people of the way of Jesus. They understood themselves as an alternative way of life compared to the world around them. They understood themselves as people who followed in the way of their leader, not necessarily just figuring out some belief sets that they all agreed on. That all came later. Before Christianity was considered a religion, it was about a relationship with Jesus. And it shaped everything about their identity and everything about their understanding of how they related to each other and to God. People who lived out the works and the ways and the words of Jesus, starting with this core command to love God and to love neighbor as yourself. The beginning of John outlines this Jesus way really clearly. If you look through, you'll see where these references are. The way of Jesus is a story of incarnation. The way of Jesus, the Jesus way is a story of life and light. The Jesus way is a story of grace and truth. Let me just talk about each of these real quick. The, the way of Jesus is a story of incarnation, becoming flesh. Jesus becomes fully present with us. In the beginning was the word. When Jesus' story becomes our story, we realize that everywhere we go, we have the opportunity to express the love of Jesus, right? And at Mill City Church, some of our community moved into the neighborhood and, and, and came into Northeast. And after a lot of prayer and a lot of no's, we finally got a yes 
from the current principal back then, the, the principal of Sheridan School, to let us worship here. And we worshiped and sat in these seats, I think, for the first time in February of 2009, right as Michaela Binder was being born. We came right here and we sat in these seats for the very first time. And somewhere along the way, if you're here with us now, you said yes and you took on this mission. Physically moving in and becoming present, the incarnate love of Jesus through us in action. Because you said yes, nearly 8 million meals have been served to hungry kids in our cities because of the way in which every meal was birthed from this church. Because you said yes, hundreds of people have experienced the love of Jesus and been told about the love of Jesus and the relationship that they can have with Jesus. Because you said yes, when the pandemic hit, the local newspaper covered uh, in a big article about how Mill City Church had been loving the community since 2008, before we even had a name, and, and was talking about how our efforts of trying to love people in this huge crisis. And I could go on and on, but so much has happened through our mission. And I think that Mill City story has just begun. But it's all because we said yes. And we moved in, and we chose to live a story of love. And now you all live wherever you live. And you, in the flesh, have moved in to whatever neighborhood you're a part of. And we've got people now, it's incredible, from Bloomington to Blaine and from Woodbury to Maple Grove and all, all over the, the country who are moving into the neighborhood and saying, I'm going to love this neighborhood in the name of Jesus. And that's what we're about doing together wherever we find ourselves. The Jesus way is a story of life and light. It's easy to see that our world experiences a lot of darkness and death. But everywhere Jesus went, there was light and life. And the power of sin and brokenness was taken away. And so when Jesus' story becomes our story, with the authority in the name of Jesus, we have the opportunity to, wherever we go, to be light and life, shining that into the darkness in the places that we experience it, and letting Jesus' light shine in the dark corners of our lives and reveal the places in us where we need healing from the sin and the brokenness and need forgiveness. The Jesus way is a story of grace and truth. Perhaps you've thought about grace and truth. It's said a number of times here in John 1. The combination of grace and and truth is what makes the Jesus way so compelling. Simultaneously, Jesus offers grace upon grace, yet the words of Jesus call people higher, call people deeper into something more compelling, something only possible when we have the freedom from the sin and the brokenness. Saying yes to the story of Jesus means our story will be a story of truth and a story of grace. Extending grace to people and seeing ourselves as not powering over people but serving them but sometimes truth, where we speak truth, Jesus spoke a lot of truth to power, to people who were using their power for injustice. And speaking truth to other people when we say, I love you too much not to tell you that God wants something more for you. So we see that the way of Jesus is a story of incarnation, of light and life, and of grace and truth. I'm going to have the worship team come back up. When I look at this, when I look at what it looks like to be fully present everywhere you go, to be life bringers, not life drainers, to offer radical grace and to love people with meaningful truth, this just doesn't seem like the other stories that I see around me. So the question for all of us today is will you say yes to making Jesus' story your story? Maybe for the first time or maybe just in a fresh way. The way of Jesus pursuing that alternative story. If you're like most of us, you're going to have to do it every day because the other stories are going to pull at our identity. And today I do want to make a special request and a special question for all of you today. Here we are, our first time back home at Sheridan, and I want to invite you to say yes in a new way to the mission that God has for this church. Like Adobe said, whether you've been here for 13 years or 13 minutes, will you say yes to the new season that God has our church on? To come together and say together we can love people in a deeper way than we could apart? To say the story of Jesus is not one of individualism, but of the family of God who moves into the neighborhood and says, there's a God who loves you no matter what. No matter what you've done, no matter what's been done to you, there's a new start. There's a fresh start. And together, we can do that. Will you say yes to that mission again in a fresh way with us? The true light that gives light to everyone has come into the world. And you are invited to step into that light and embrace and join that story. Let's say yes to that story together. Amen.